You are listening to the Effective Statistician Podcast, the weekly podcast with Alexander Schacht and Benjamin Pieske, designed to help you reach your potential, lead great science, and serve patients without becoming overwhelmed by work. Today, I'm giving you a bonus episode about COVID or Corona and what I think about it. <music> Today, this will be a little bit of a different episode. Um, it's a little bit something that was on my mind, on my heart, and I just needed to get it out. So listen to it, agree with it, disagree with it. If you don't like it, comment about it on social media or on the blog and uh, let me know what you think about that. This podcast is produced in association with PSI, a community dedicated to leading and promoting the use of statistics within the healthcare industry for the benefit of patients. Join PSI today to further develop your statistical capabilities with access to the video demand content library, free registration to all PSI webinars, and much, much more. Visit the PSI website at psiweb.org to learn more about PSI activities I'm a PSI member today. These are probably currently the most used words and it speaks for the impact that this pandemic has on all what we do. It's discussed in the news, it's discussed at work, it's discussed at all the different situations. And there's a couple of interesting learnings I take from that being a statistician, being a statistician in the healthcare field. And I want to reflect in this episode a little bit about my learnings here. I will not dive too much into the details of the data itself and what they mean and what are the consequences and the political will behind these things and why certain countries do some things and some other countries do the opposite. And about all the other aspects here, but really about some reflections on what I see out there and what that means for us as statisticians. The first observation is that I hardly see any tables out there. There's huge amounts of visualization, yeah, both interactive visualization like the John Hopkins dashboard, and uh, explanatory visualizations like this really, really nice visualization from the Washington Post and this flattening the curve and so many other visualizations. And in um, the episode with Alberto Cairo, we'll actually talk a little bit about a couple of these in more detail. But what really strikes me is there, we... In the pharma industry, zero industry, we are still primarily driving our results to all our business partners, to the world out there via tables. Look at clinicaltrials.gov, all tables. Look at all the clinical study reports into all the summary of efficacy, summary of safety, all these different things. Tables, 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 and yet more tables. Why don't we see more nice visualizations there? Why don't we see more interactive visualizations there? There's some really, really nice case studies where we have looked into nice ways to look into the data interactively. And we have talked about this, about this in this podcast a couple of times. Yeah, so there is this uh, episode about Tables are not the key deliverables. There's a really, really nice interview with Zach Scrivenek about a figure says more than 1,000 tables. We have the episode about the wonderful Wednesday, an initiative to the visualization special interest group that I also will give a link to. There's an episode with Alberto Cairo. There's an episode that is coming up with the founders of Makeover Monday, which is a awesome visualization community project. There's a lot of really, really nice examples in terms of using visualizations in a 
very, very effective way. Yet still, most of what we do are PDF tables. And to be honest, I think we really need to step up here and we need to change the processes, we need to change our standards of working and we need to be, become better at conveying our messages through visualizations. And also, I recently was involved in a discussion at work where it was about reducing tables. Does that sound familiar to you? That we are asked to reduce tables because we are doing too many tables for this study and too many tables for that study and we are paying by table and so every table more is more cost and but isn't there an easier way to reduce the number of tables by just giving all this information in an interactive way? Especially if you want to understand your data. Let's say you want to look into lots of different efficacy or safety endpoints across different subgroups, across different time points, across different populations, across different whatsoever. It doesn't really make sense to deliver hundreds of tables with all these numbers in it. It's much easier for everybody to consume the information if you have an interactive dashboard that displays it. By the way, also the really, really nice episode with uh, Shafi about um, how he programs things and uh, about how he builds his company. And he has also developed really, really nice visualizations. So check out Shafi Chowdhury's homepage at Shafi Consultancy. We need to step up our game here and learn from what is currently out there in the COVID crisis, where you see so many different visualizations. Some of them surely can be improved. And that's another topic. We need to be better in designing our visualizations, both if we want to use them exploratory as well as explanatory, for sure. Yeah. To be honest, I'm not the biggest fan of the John Hopkins dashboard because this map there in the, in the middle is, I think, for me, not the most important thing. For me, is a much more, more important thing is hidden somewhere else that is the cases, the new cases per day, which is really a little bit hard to find. But that is, there's so many other nice things out there and we need to look, get into that area of better visualization of our data, better communication of our data. Another interesting topic is that John Hopkins, for example, get the data from many different sources. They look for everything that is out there and pull from lots of lots of different sources. However, when we want to answer a specific question, I see very often the habit that we just look at the one source of data that we have directly in front of us. The studies that we are just working on. It. But there's so much other data out there that we could leverage to answer a specific question. There's real-world evidence data, there's literature data, there may be other studies that someone else in your company has worked on, or something that is available through a clinical study data request, and these other transparency initiatives. So if you have a question to solve, we shouldn't just go at the most obvious and easy source. We should look into many more sources and see whether we can answer the question much more precisely instead of kind of fitting the question to the data that we have easily at hand. The next topic. When I look into all these different data of patients being infected with the virus across the different countries, I think there's a lot of misunderstandings here. My perception is there's a lot of comparisons between countries. And then people say, ah, look at this country. Obviously, these politicians get it right. And in this other country, they completely mess it up. I'm not completely sure that this is the case. I'm not completely sure that we can make these comparisons between the different countries. Because the data sources, the way the data is generated is different in the different countries. The way the 
health system works is different in these different countries. The way tests are conducted is different in these different countries. The way this is reporting into the John Hopkins dashboard is different between the different countries. There are so many differences between the different countries that I'm not sure we can really just compare countries and say, well, here the system works and here it doesn't work. And what I'm missing here is where are the statisticians in the news explaining these? I see a lot of medical people, politicians and all kind of different experts. But where are the statisticians? Where are the people that really have learned to deal with numbers and explain them in the right way? Where are they? I hardly see them. We need to step up as statisticians. We need more leadership from our side. We need our associations to step up, become more visible, more professional, more impactful with the media, more impactful with our society, more impactful with politicians. I think we understand the strengths and the limitations of all these data. We can't just put these numbers out there and then assume that people understand them. That just doesn't work. It doesn't work within the companies that we're working in and it doesn't work much more in the general public. We can't just throw over a table to the other side and assume they will understand where all the strengths, the limitations, what they can infer from it, what they can't infer from it. I was just in a discussion on LinkedIn where there were, you know, COVID data presented and there were some claims made from it. And I I was thinking, are these actually the right data? Should we look at the death rates or should we look at the absolute number of deaths or should we look at this being positively tested? What are all the different numbers? And I think for these different questions we have, we need to use different numbers. So we need to better explain what is happening there publicly and within our companies. And I'm guilty of that as well in my career. I have just forwarded tables without any kind of saying about that. And I have just handed them over to the medical writer. Here you deal with it and you make sense of that. That is not the right way. We as statisticians should look into these numbers, should make sense out of these numbers and help them for others to be understood. So if we put out numbers in the public, for example, in in form of a dashboard, we should help the community to understand what they are seeing there. It's really great what John Hopkins has done there in terms of pulling all these things together. But to be honest, I think they could have done one step more and they could have addressed a couple of the problems with the data and could have, you know, have some verbatim about it, use the data for where it cannot be used for, how reliable the data is, where are the strengths, where are the limitations, any guidance of use of the data, anything that the media can work with. This dashboard is used in the media all over the world. But if I'm a journalist and look at this map and all these numbers there, I can't see whether, you know, there's a difference directly in terms of the numbers between the different countries, how they're differently calculated, how, what the different sources of them are. Can I really compare the Chinese numbers with the German numbers? Probably not because the mortality rate between those being affected is dramatically different, not even speaking about the difference between Germany and Italy. So there's obviously some things in the numbers that needs to be better explained. And we need to be there as statisticians. We need to help people make sense of the data that we give to them. And we need to do that on a constant basis. Of course, there's also the audience needs to step up in terms of data literacy. I think as a society, we need to step up in terms of data literacy, for sure. But who should train these people? We as statisticians need to train them. 
It's something that we should do on a regular basis all the time. And by the way, this is a huge opportunity to be more visible in the organizations, to network within the organizations, to build connections and relationships in the organizations. And have you been in a training where you have presented something and explained something to, you know, very senior physicians, for example, and they say, now I understand. Wow. In these situations, you build a relationship. You have helped them. And that will they will not forget about that. And then they will invite you to meetings or to discussions where you maybe haven't been even aware about them happening in the, before. So I think training is a huge opportunity for us to be more impactful. The last learning from this is from the really, really nice Washington Post article with this nice visualization in terms of how different social distancing impacts the spread of the disease. And for me, what I take from that is that's a really nice case study for how scenario simulations can convey a very, very clear message. So if you want to show conditional probabilities. If you want to show what happens if you have different prior information in your patient analysis, if you want to do any of these more complex things, it's really nice to look into, okay, scenario A, B, C, D, maybe E, and then show what happens if we assume this. What happens if we assume that? What happens If we use some extreme scenario, how that, will that affect the data? And you can use that for missing data. You can use that for different prior information and Bayesian analysis. You can use that for all kind of different things, uh, for sample science calculations, for predicting the probability of technical success. There's so many cases where we can use these really, really nice scenario approach to communicate effectively what might happen if we assume different things, conditional probabilities. And then you can speak about, okay, how likely are these uh, assumptions? Some of them may get some probabilities to them. Some of us, maybe you don't, but maybe you don't need to. But the scenario approach is a really, really nice one. So that's a little bit of maybe a little bit of a rant from my side this time uh, in this bonus episode about the COVID crisis. So stay tuned, stay healthy in all these situations, take care of yourself because that is really, really important. Take care of your family and your loved ones. And for me personally, I'm currently in social distancing and Maybe I'm more used to it because I'm anyway <laughs> working a lot from home. But I know for those that I used to go into the office every day, it's quite a challenge. There's a lot of tools out there in terms of working more effectively from home. Um, we just published an episode about working from home. And check out that as well to stay healthy in the current situation. Like always, I end with just be an effective statistician. <laughs>